Welcome to the Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. If you're looking to get more out of your Shenandoah Valley experience, then this is the podcast for you. You'll meet interesting people, musicians, and comedians that perform here and find out more about what you can do and see. Whether you live here or plan to visit, listen to explore what makes our unique slice of heaven. Now here's your host, Don Davis Womack. Hello, Lappers. We have a dynamic person and musical guest with us today, Reverend Bill Howard. Bill also happens to have a background in improv comedy and is one of the founders and original members of James Madison University's New and Improv Troupe. With over 20 years of performance experience in the music scene, Bill is the singer, songwriter, lead guitarist, show promoter, and booker for the Shenandoah Valley's own Americana jam band sweethearts, The Judy Chops. For the past decade, The Judy Chops have been and wowing audiences with their depth, musicianship, and high-energy live shows. This seven-piece band comprised of family and friends has evolved from a Shenandoah Valley favorite into one of the hottest acts in the Virginia music scene. Their unique take on Americana is a fusion of modern and vintage musical styles, blending elements of swing, blues, rock, and soul for a sonic experience. Huffington Post calls genre-defying. Bill also hosts the Reverend Bill's confessional. Welcome to the show, Reverend Bill Howard. It's great to have you on today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this uh, for a while now, so... Ah, no, we finally connected with our busy selves, and here we are. And I just have to say, Lappers... Life is amazing, and this is amazing, because check this out. X2 Comedy's very first show was at Restless Moons Brewing here in Harrisonburg in March 2018. That show was myself as host opener doing some stand-up and JMU's new and improv. How cool is that? Because of what you founded years ago, Bill, it led to that experience. And look where we are now. So I'm excited to be here with you today, learn more about you and your journey from those days until now. So my first question is, can you tell us more about your journey from being a founder of James Madison University's New and Improv Troupe to becoming a prominent figure in the Virginia music scene with the Judy Chops? Absolutely. I, uh, you know, as a kid, um, I always loved being the center of attention. You know, I think that I, I uh, grew up uh, with my grandparents. And so um, I didn't really have any brothers and sisters around, although I do have siblings they weren't around every day. So I got to kind of be uh, the center a lot and hang out with the adults. And I think performing kind of was in my blood early on. (laughs) And uh, music has always been there. We were always a musical family and there was always, my grandmother uh, is a guitarist and she taught me how to play guitar. And there were always singers in the family and my mom plays some piano and, 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 even a few semi-professional performers and bands and things like that. So that was always kind of uh, in the DNA. And uh, so I think it was, it was natural that I found my way to theater at some point because I, I always sang, I always could, could do that end of things. But uh, around high school, I, I followed a girl uh, of course (laughs) into uh, um Shannon Arts uh, up in uh, the Stanton Augusta County area, which they still have a great theater up there. Um, but they used to do this thing called teen theater in the summers. And uh, a lot of the cool kids that I got to hang out with in high school uh, were in that, uh, including my girlfriend. And they did a, a production of uh, Les Miserables. And it wasn't the musical version. They were it mm. was just a play version of the of the of the book. And I, of course, was like, well, she's going to be there all summer long. I better go do that so that I can <laughs> hang out with my girlfriend all summer long. <laughs> and I always say kind of the apocryphal, uh, you know, footnote is, um, the relationship did not last, but my love for performing in theater definitely like started there and has never really gone away. Um, yeah. cause I, 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 from that point on, I was Mr. Theater in high school and, you know, president of the drama club and leads in plays. And at, at some point there was a uh, group uh, that predates new and improv called Cilia. And oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't know if you know, Christian Parrott. Um, he's a yes. musician. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. So Christian Parrot was in a group called Cilia. And Christian oh. is also Nichols and Wiener, of course. Yes. Uh, yes. We know of each other. We've met. Yeah. So when I was in Very high school. Very funny guy. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah. he, his group Cilia, there was a, a student teacher for our theater classes from JMU that came to, to uh drama club and said, you know, we've got this improv group at JMU and we want to, you know, if you want, we can come and do a, uh, uh, you know, a workshop. And then they were going to do a performance, you know, in the theater later that, you know, week or whatever. And I went to the, to the workshop and just fell in love, like immediately fell in love with improv. It was, it was, I had done a few of the like Uta Hagen, you know, theater games. Oh, at that yeah. point. So I knew, I knew the the ideas of what was, what was being presented, but the fact that you could create these, you know, plays essentially, you know, basically being, being like, if you know anything about story arcs, you can create these like fully formed, you know, moments and ideas. And I just head over heels for it. And from about that was maybe my sophomore year of high school so through high school i got really immersed in improv and tried to learn as much as i could about it so much so that by the end of my you know the high school career i actually went back to the middle school and taught improv classes oh, because the drama teacher neat. she came and asked she said what what do students coming into the high school need and i said all of them need better improv training yeah and I, I kind of got behind that. So by the time I got to JMU, the Noon and Probed had had one semester where they, the original four kids that went to, you know, actually get the thing, you know, chartered and founded, they had never performed. They had mm-hmm. just started practicing and we, you know, you're, it's, you know, probably what, September, uh, you know, all the freshmen are around with their backpacks and walking around and <laughs> I see a, a table that says new and improv. And so I go right to it because at that point, that group Cilia had, had gone away and new and improv had filled the void, you know, and I, I remembered all that and said, you know, I'm, I'm totally about it. And so I, from that point on, I, you know, I put your, put your little name down and get into the group. And, uh, I think I, 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 I Pretty sure this is true. I remember the very first Noon Improv show happened at the Artful Dodger for Gardy Lou magazine at JMU. Really? It was it was a really great evening and some really heavy poetry was read. Really heavy poetry. Like sad, you know, and then in some some very, you know, stoic literature and all of us goofball improv kids are sitting <laughs> off to the side like looking around the room going we're getting ready to literally like this is going to be completely <laughs> different from what has been happening to this point so we kind of like went outside and we're like we got to we got to think on this so i i think this is true i think i'm the first person to have ever stepped on stage in a new and improv show because we were also nervous about introducing the show. Yeah. And so my, my idea was, I was like, well, I'll go out and pretend that I'm going to read a poem and oh. I'll, I'll, I'll look around and I'll, 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 I'll go from there. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so that was it. And then that and we, we crushed and from there we just kept doing it and, you know, Honestly, I always, this is the other funny thing. I, I actually dropped out of JMU after two years. You I did? Stayed, I did. I stayed in the improv group for four years. <laughs> so I, <laughs> is that supposed to happen? <laughs> I don't think so. I'm actually in some JMU yearbooks that I'm not actually a student in where I just come up and I think we put different names every time. I just kind of like, I'm like there in the background. I, I it was, uh, I got more, uh, that's my, my college education was really just new and improv. So <laughs> <laughs> what year was your first year in new and improv? Do you know? It would have been, I guess my freshman year would have started in 1999. And then wow. it was like 2000 was probably that first performance. It was sometime that winter, you know, either I couldn't remember if it was before, before the end of the semester or after, but it was something somewhere around there. And then, yeah, we just, you know, I, I, I gosh, how many hours of improv that I did at in that. And I just loved it. It was, it was, you know, 
uh, uh, an education unlike any other, honestly. And I've right. used improv more than any other skill set in my whole life. I mean, even more than music, even though that's my my career path. And, yeah. and honestly, those two career paths intersected at JMU anyway, because I was the only one in the group at the time that really had a lot of music ability in terms mm-hmm. of like playing ability. A lot of people could sing, but I became the de facto, you know, accompanist, accompanist for the group. So I had, uh, you know, any of our musical games or uh, whatnot, I would be the guy on the guitar over there, you know, doing that. And <laughs> I always think it actually like made me, it made me a better guitar player because I had to learn a lot about like musical styles to do these games. So I had to sit down and actually think about, well, why is this a country chord pattern versus a blues pattern and what makes those things happen for an audience. And it's, they kind of started like forming, you know, at the same time. And honestly, when I dropped out of college, I did it to become a musician. (laughs) I went and started (laughs) playing in bands and, you know, playing in bars and it was a real easy, not easy, but it was a way to make extra money while I'm kind of, floating around trying to figure out what I'm <laughs> what I'm doing and if I'm going back to school and uh, you know I'm skipping a lot but uh, you know about 20 ish years later yeah. I'm here talking on this podcast <laughs> I know isn't that crazy yeah that was in Michigan in 1999 I got married on Mackinac Island oh, in nice. August so oh, you start yeah so you started something then ended up impacting my life today. And my husband is a JMU professor. He started doing stand up a couple of years ago. Oh. And if I just may say so, he's pretty darn good at it. So <laughs> it's I'm, just crazy your influence years ago having an impact. Isn't that profound we, to think we about? We talked about it. Yeah, we actually talked about it when we were doing it. I remember, like, you know, we we realized at some point you know, a few years into the group, it was like, wow, this could go on, you know, after we're not doing it anymore. And what does that even look like? And, you know, it's, it's been cool. Like I'm still friends with, with a fair amount of the people that are, that were those original, you know, few in in noon and proud, they call it by the day. So, Mm. you know, if you're day one, day two, I'm day two, because okay. technically there were four or five of them that kind of chartered the thing before us. I and see, so yeah. everybody's got a day. So the, I'm still friends with some of my days two through <laughs> probably four to six ish, <laughs> you know, and then and when then you're dive point, bombing your books. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll still see yeah. around Harrisonburg every once in a while, I'll see someone with a new and improv shirt or something like that. And I'll, I'll be like, Hey, new and improv. And they'll look up and I'll get like, Day two. Oh, <laughs> and did I've it had a, a few yeah, kids be yeah. like, oh my gosh, like I didn't know if anybody was still around. I've had many people say, I had no idea anybody was even still around from that time. I'm like, we're not that old, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you guys only 20 like, years. <laughs> you're like ancients to them. <laughs> hey, to me too. I mean, honestly, uh, <laughs> those are the moments where you're like, oh wow, maybe I've been doing this a while. <laughs> Yeah, I want to expand on that a little bit. You alluded and started to kind of talk about this, but how do you feel over the years your background in improv comedy has influenced your music career? Well, I mean, you know, in in real practical terms, being on stage is challenging for some musicians, I think. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I know a lot of, you know, amazing musicians that don't have comfort in stagecraft. And Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, uh, for one in the Judy chops, we have a lot of theater kids. A lot of us were music kids and band geeks, but also, you know, doing plays and trying to do musicals and all that kind of thing. And I think because of that, we we've always been a little more sensitive to how we interact with the crowd, how we, you know, how we act on stage and how we move Mm -hmm. around the stage and, and how the stage looks, because it is important, you know, even in those moments and you, you do with what you can a lot (laughs) in the bar, in the bar band days, you know, it's like, Oh, you've got this (laughs) corner. You can't be like, I don't know about uh, the, the draperies and things like that. We want to put over everything since we only have a four foot square (laughs) of space for (laughs) for this, but uh, you know, but nonetheless, I mean, that part of it for sure. And, and the ability to talk and, and be like kind of an MC and move a show along, you know, I think, 
our fans have gotten used to that from us, this, this idea of we're kind of, uh, Carnival Barkers. By <laughs> Carnival like, Barkers. I love it. <laughs> and, 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 uh, and the other real, uh, you know, and this is even outside of the music world, even in, in other professional pursuits, I've noticed that that ability to think on your feet and mm-hmm. the ability to not to be just to communicate, because I think really what improv does, or at least, you know, the way I always looked at it was it makes you a really good communicator mm-hmm. because not only are you processing information that's coming in from possibly multiple sources, you also have the ability to, you know, turn on certain things and, and, and not, and even if you get lost in your thoughts, if you're quick and you can think on your feet, you know, those little neurons firing will get you from one place to the other and keep you moving forward. So, you know, interviews, I always joke. It's like, if I get an interview for a job, nine times out of 10, I'm going to get it. Cause I can always, you know, uh, yeah. talk. I can, I yeah. can, I can kind of do it. And if I, if I want it, I can usually, <laughs> I can usually talk my way. If you get me in the door, I can usually talk. That's my way all you it. need. Yeah. So I've, I've been doing that con for years. <laughs> and it's the same. I mean, I, and then on a more, you know, actual musical end of it, I actually look at the same concepts of musical improv as I do, you know, theatrical or comedic improv, you know, it's Mm. a lot of those same uh, concepts are the same, you know, interacting with your scene partner, in this case, your bandmates and your, and the other musicians, musicians on stage, the ability to kind of take those motifs that they're working with and, you know, make them a more interesting, you know, uh, piece of dialogue because really music is the same way it's dialogue and, we're all just having little conversations with each other. So I, I, I think, you know, I've been able to kind of take those, you know, more global concepts of improv and just really throw them back at everything that I do because, you know, I like that world and I like being, you know, I like kind of that idea of discovery, you know, no matter what, if you do something for long enough, we've been a band in the chops for 15 plus years at this point. And so we, you know, you play some of the same songs for 15 years, they get old and <laughs> it's kind of hard to play them. But, you know, if you keep that kind of fresh thing and we do that a lot, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it open for improv and we have our things that we do all the time, but you know, that's, that's always been in the backbone. So I just, uh, yeah, I love that world. I, and I, I miss, to be honest, I miss the, uh, the actual comedy world of it quite a bit. I, I haven't done it in so long that it's, I'm sure I would you'd be, for the first time in a long time, nervous on stage. <laughs> I got up and did improv, but you know, it's one of these days I'm gonna I'm gonna go out and 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 try uh try my hand at it again. Well, that's right. We got Rocktown Improv. They, you know? I've, I've talked uh, a bit with uh with Jonathan and a few folks and and um I it's gonna happen. I'm sure I'm sure I'll make my way down <laughs> one of these nights when I when I that's some two of my favorite improv artists that I've ever worked with is Jonathan Stewart and John Huffman. Oh, John Huffman, man. I was in, um, uh, Oh, what were they called back then? I, I was in a group with John, um, no strings Rainbow, attached, no right? strings attached. Yeah. Yeah. So that, um, and prior to that, they were called mental flossing. So oh, yes, I, I forgot that. Yes. Right after I started the chops, um, or right around the same time, I was doing improv with uh, mental flossing, and then we changed to no strings attached. And it really, I was, I was pretty, I was getting more involved in that and and doing it a lot more. And then once the chops started having a lot of shows, it was like oh, I can't really, I don't have enough time to do all of these performance things. So I had to mm-hmm. kind of shift and Pick do a more of the music. Yeah, mm-hmm. but John, what's funny at that point, John. Um, Huffman, uh, I can't remember if he was in JMU at that moment or not, but pretty early after the band started and John was at JMU in a video class. So one of our very first real videos for the chops, John Huffman did as a student project because he was. Oh, uh, that's great. (laughs) I thought that was awesome because it was like, oh, this is like all my worlds are uh, are colliding right now. (laughs) Yeah, you have a very robust music career with the Judy Chops, and they have been described as a genre-defying Americana band 
Can you explain the unique fusion of musical styles that defines your sound? Absolutely. Um, we we started kind of as a. We all have backgrounds from from various places. Um, there there were uh, four of us originally that were kind of the core members, and thankfully most of us are still active in the band today. You know, uh, the uh, two sisters Molly and Sally Murphy, uh, along with myself and Jess Berg, our drummer, um, and we all kind of came at it at a different angle. the The girls grew up in a more Appalachian. Uh, folk singer you know, uh, trad, you know, kind of tradition. Uh, and they moved down here, Molly and Sally, they moved down from New York. And so their, their parents had that always going to those kind of festivals and, and, uh, old time music was, was huge in their family and their moms and dad, both are great singers. So they, similar to me, the way they grew up, they kind of just always were, you know, mom and dad were going to music festivals and, you know, mm -hmm. both of them were upright bassists. So they they have early memories of kind of, you know, hanging out backstage, watching their dad and mom, you know, be oh, performers. Fun. <laughs> and, and, you know, Jess, she comes at it completely differently. You know, she she just always grew up in a family that loved music. Um, in middle school, um, she did uh, there's Orf Ensemble. So it's kind of. Mm uh marimbas and xylophones and percussion and things like that and they the, it's uh, a program in augusta county schools that that she got involved with and they would do these concerts and she loved that and then when she got into high school because she was never in band she didn't really transition into doing that and actually became a theater kid so i met jess uh when noon improv this is again i'm not even a student at this point, I'm just <laughs> in the group. They said they were like, "That's so good." Do you want to go back to your old high school and each improv for this thing they used to do called the Chicken Challenge, which was the big? They would get all the schools together and they would do a big day of short form improv. So I had recently been out of school, so anything that I could make a little extra money doing was like good work. I was working with Shannon Arts and doing teaching some improv and teaching some sketch comedy and that idea at that point. So yeah, I, I actually met Jess the very first time as a high school student, she was president of, of Fort Defiance drama department. <laughs> and I came back to teach all those kids improv comedy. And then, yeah, it's uh, a year later I'm on stage with at this point, a whole other band and her and her friends started coming out to see our band play. And those two friends were the Murphy sisters. And so, you know, once again, all that like improv world led to now I've known these people for 20 plus years and we've been, we've been playing music together, you know, most of that time. So in all those genres, then because we all came at it from a slightly different place, like I was a already in band world at that point, I was playing bars and a lot of blues and that end of stuff. And we're always writing songs. And then the Murphy sisters having that like kind of Appalachian mountain type music, you know, in their DNA, we, we all just kind of had those little things that came at it. And, you know, Jess and I were both into more classic rock and that kind of thing too, growing up with, you know, our parents both being really into music like that. And, and so early on when we started forming the band, it, it, we never wanted to be like, Oh, we want to be that thing or this thing. I because see you just start like realizing like, well, if all your influences are varied, why not like highlight those influences? Yeah. And as we kept going, you know, the, the way that the Judy chops in particular formed, I was in a band with Molly and Sally and I was in a band with Jess, two separate bands. And both of those bands, I, I got called in to be in Molly and Sally's band because they needed a guitar player when their guitar player left. And they were doing kind of, swingy swingy stuff plus almost like old crow medicine show you know mm -hmm. that end of uh, of of the more americana stuff what was right. the beginning of what we all now call americana so we were doing that kind of sound over in charlottesville in that band and at the same time i was doing more of like a weird electric folk band with like my buddies over here in the valley 
And Jess was the percussionist for that. And both bands kind of ran their course, but we were all still buddies. And we all at that point worked together at Natural Chimneys for the most part. But <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Me and Molly and, and, and Jess all worked there. I was the park manager. Molly was the assistant manager. <laughs> Jess awesome. was our like program person and things like that. So we just, any downtime, we were already playing and, you know, writing music and, and working on, you know, covers and things like that, going to open mics together. And so we just realized, you know, well, we can keep the best parts of both of these bands, you know, functioning. Yeah. And we already have the backbone. So it, we were able to kind of hit the ground running and, and already be, you know, like sound like a band that had been playing together for a few years, but it was really just like, well, I'm going to take a little bit of this set list from this band and we're going to take a little bit of this set list from this band and smash it together. And, you know, you just, you just keep doing it. And for a long time too, as a songwriter, I just realized it's more fun to not put any rules on how you're writing a song. If you always write, I'm going to write a blues song every time, then over time, they all begin to sound the same. So I, you know, I see, I let the songs kind of come out and it's probably highly dependent on what I'm listening to at the moment. You know, Uh, some of our albums tend to look that way too. You know, it's like, Oh, we must be (laughs) listening to a lot of funk and soul music right now. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that's great. We're going to talk more about that band in a little bit, but first I wanted to talk about this because I learned about the fact that you have your own live streaming show. Yeah. Yeah. And it's called Reverend Bill's Confessional that you host. And you started that during the pandemic and now over 46 episodes to date. I want to know what inspired you to start this weekly live stream and how has it evolved over time? Well, we definitely, you know, when the pandemic hit, I don't think any of us realized what it was going to mean. You know, Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, obviously not not just, you know, us in the band world and music world and whatnot, but everybody, you know, in fact, I remember we were on a tour that spring. Um, We had just done a little very short, like three or four day run with a couple of friends. We ended in Richmond. It was March of 2020. And we had just heard that there was going to be a shutdown. And and we were like, oh, you know, that I guess the rest of our spring is kind of messed up. But, you know, we'll be back by summertime. And <laughs> in fact, I think there's somewhere uh, I, I did a radio interview um, with WMRA and it was me and Brent Wagler and another performer. I think she was a burlesque uh, performer. And they asked us about, you know, what we thought, you know, it was coming, coming. And, and at that point we were all very, you know, positive, positive, you know, (laughs) Oh, you know, I'm sure by later this summer, things will be sorted out. And, you know, as things just kept going, you know, it just, you realize like, this isn't stopping, you know? Mm -hmm. And I pretty early, you know, I, I think it was April of 2020, um, a friend of mine, uh, named Justin Trawick up in DC started doing a live stream. And, and it was just him and his, his partner and they were in the living room and singing and playing. And, and he started getting a lot of like attention, like a Washington post article got done about it. And I just started thinking like, you know, this is such a great platform because it dawned on me that this was the first time in my adult life that I hadn't been performing, you know, in some regular schedule, you know, Mm. even in the years where Mm -hmm. I was not really touring and performing in a band, I was still going out to open mics or I was writing or I was hosting a jam. And there was always some reason to keep, keep playing and practicing and writing. And, um, I just, luckily at that point I was living in this house with, uh, my, um, my partner, uh, Brittany and, uh, our sound guy, Alan Seitz from the Judy shops. And, you know, I looked at Alan and I said, Hey man, we got to figure this live stream thing out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. <laughs> so we, we literally, the room I'm in right now, uh, we, it's, you know, our living, well, it was our living room. We've now turned it into a beautiful dining room. Um, <laughs> Good. But we, we just set up a, you know, we, we like researched what everybody was doing and what equipment we would need to buy. And I just kind of, you know, luckily I had a little bit band money, you know, and, and personal money saved up. So we were able to kind of, 
with whatever we didn't have, you know, your first like, you know, focus, right. I was like, Oh, what's this thing? And they, (laughs) all this like weird, like equipment stuff that started becoming like hard to find all of a sudden, because literally every creative in the world was like, Oh my God, I got to work from home. I've got to figure out how to practice with my band or do a podcast or, you know, like everybody kind of had that moment. And so, you know, luckily we were able to, get everything together and and hit the ground running with the confessional pretty quick. And, you know, I've had this nickname Reverend Bill for a long time. So it was, uh, you know, when I was trying to think about like, well, how would I differentiate myself in a sea of people doing live streams at this point? Because even (laughs) a month in, it was already like everybody had something figured out. (laughs) We were like, well, you know, what about the confessional? And we'll do it on Sundays. And we'll open up people to questions, you know, if they want to ask questions. And if not, you know, we'll do some theme stuff and we'll just see where we go, you know. And it it became, you know, more of a impactful thing for people than I I considered, you know, because for really when you start something like that, I think as a performer, it really <laughs> not to sound vain, but it it grew out of my own need to perform. Like I mm-hmm. do to just be in front of people not even necessarily getting feedback. It's not even about that. There's some, there's some drive as a performer Mm -hmm. when you're not just a, an artist that writes or plays music or records music. You know, I, I love all those sides of it, but I see all of that as a separate, you know, they're all separate uh, things, you know, Mm -hmm. but my need as a performer was, was definitely, you know, lacking uh in in the pandemic so the the confessional started that way for me and then there was like a community that built around it and fans that that you know would come back week after week and and people that said you know they look i needed this outlet and this positivity and this you know this love you know and it's coming my way as much as you needed it going your way and it really like i i i it's such a weird thing. Like in those moments where you're in a really weird and bad situation, when something like that is the mitigating circumstance and this really beautiful thing happens instead, you know, we could have been, you know, sitting in here and being sad and wondering when, when I will ever play a show again, which I certainly had those moments, you know, in in between. But then I knew every Sunday I was going to go down here to the living room and, you know, fire up the computer and, get my guitar out and do it. And, you know, through the week I would write scripts and, you know, have <laughs> things figured out and like, you know, know what I was going to talk about, practice my delivery on, on things. And, um, you know, even over time, like, uh, all of the people that lived in the house kind of got into it, you know, um, my, my partner, Brittany, she, became just as much of a part of the show as anything else. People knew who Brittany was and <laughs> wanted her to talk and people knew our cat. Once we got a cat, you know, <laughs> that's great. It's like, um, uh... the, uh, Alan eventually moved, moved out and we had another roommate move in. It was still pandemic times. And he was a musician. His name's Ivan uh, Christo. And uh, he was also live streaming. So then there were two of us in the house doing like live streams and I got involved with his show. It was a little more like, Honestly, it was a little more theater sketch comedy stuff. He was doing okay. something called Empire of Excellence. Oh, that's and awesome. It was all like Wayne's World esque <laughs> with like, you know, like hosts I need and a to desk. Watch that. Oh, yeah. it's really great. And I, I had a character that I got to play named um um oh Dr. Deansworth. Dr. Deansworth, even before I needed the glasses. I I uh, <laughs> so I mean I, I was able to just throw in a lot of time into that world for for a couple of years. And uh, sadly, I haven't been able to keep up the the live stream. I haven't done it in a while, but I'm this year embarking on a making a solo album. So I'm I'm hoping to bring the live stream back this year. To, to start talking about the solo album and, and start reconnecting with some of those fans. Cause I've been, I've been missed. I'll be honest. I've missed it. You know, it's, it, yeah. I don't know if I could keep up that frequency. Cause I was at one point doing a Sunday show called the confessional and a Wednesday show called the devotional. And the Sunday show was always mostly original music with some themes and I would pull in some covers, but the devotional, I literally was a hundred percent covers and I would take, 
requests from people like the week before and learn them through the week. And I mean, it was a great brain thing because I, and I, and then I learned, gosh, I came away with it having written a ton of songs and learned a ton of songs for that. And, and, and was able to kind of immediately jump back into the live performance world a little, you know, I, I had an early show where a, a fan said, you know, gosh, you know, you have no rust on your, <laughs> on you at all. And I was like, man, I, I probably put in 10,000 hours of performance. <laughs> Those couple like uh, periods. So. Uh, yeah. They but say I, after 10,000, you're an expert. So I guess <laughs> I, I got something going, man. I, you know, I, I I'll, I'll take it because uh, otherwise I would have lost my mind. <laughs> Yeah, with the themes, I'm so curious about that on your live stream. Each week you did a different theme. Can you share some memorable themes or moments from those broadcasts that stood out to you? Absolutely. You know, we we would some of them would be silly. We would try to get, you know, we'd ask silly questions to the audience to try to get funny things happening. But some of the ones that really like became more poignant than I than I anticipated, you know, we um my little sister, uh, Amanda is a drummer and she came over and we did one where we, she's also a mental health professional. And so we wanted to talk about resources, you know, for mental health, because I mean, immediately and we, we grew up with a mother who battled, uh, depression and, and mm. was, you know, always in and out of institutions and dealing mm. with that end of things. And, and, you know, I think, it was immediately, you know, I, that's the first thing that came to mind was like, wow, people that are susceptible or, you know, and all of us, which is like, I E all of us, mm. um, are, you know, going to have a hard time. So that became kind of a focus. Uh, you know, we tried to make sure even after that initial mental health episode that we did, uh, we always would make sure that those resources were around and we would that's have them up with wonderful. the show yeah. and, you know, hope that people, you know, I don't know. I had some people tell me that, you know, I don't know if they use the resources, but they I had people tell me that just that kind of feeling of community helped them in their mental health. And and that idea of feeling connected when you are completely disconnected, you know, and I I, you know, luckily had people here that we, you know, were able to be in a pod together and ha- you know, have it, but I certainly you know, we connected with people virtually that, you know, over those couple of years that were alone in their houses mm-hmm. and needed that, you know, not just needed, you know, the performance aspect or, the, you know, the, the, the social aspect, but needed just the actual connection, you know, like there's other people out here and I'm not just lost. Cause there were certainly, I live a little outside of town here in Harrisonburg and, you know, I don't have many neighbors. So there were moments when I walked out and went like, is it, are we here? Is this it? <laughs> like, did, did it end? Did it end? And I didn't realize it, you know? So like, it's, did it's, I get left behind? Yeah. Right. It's right. Like, like, no, nobody's at that factory today. I guess that means, you know, <laughs> so you, you, you definitely, yeah. I, I think that, that feeling of connection and, and some of those episodes, like those ones in particular, and honestly, I had a really great time. We did some kids ones, uh, yeah. did, like some kids music ones. And that was super fun. You know, just, just having, I, you know, some, some friends would send me pictures of their kids, like bopping along and pointing up <laughs> at their TV and, you know, they had me up yeah. on the TV and stuff. And so it was, it was really cool to, to watch that. And, and honestly, it even led to, you know, post pandemic type work for me. I, I, one thing that, um, when John Prine passed away, sadly, um, mm. I did a John Prine tribute, you know, mm. night and I did a couple of them. I you know, through the like couple of years that <laughs> couple of years that we were all, you know, in doing these things. And, um, a uh, guy over in Charlottesville named Jeff Sweatman uh, saw me do that. And he was already in the process of putting together a John Prine tribute album thing to try to raise some money for a uh, music resource center over there. Mm-hmm. And he, um, he contacted me and asked if I would, I had the ability, one had the ability to record remotely and would I want to record his track to be on, on this album. And so I, you know, that at that point, uh, luckily my, roommate knew how to do some of that. So we, we sat down <laughs> and did a track and, and, and sent it out. And then it now is on an album and I'm 
still we're still putting together tribute shows and things like that off of that. So it it really, you know, it ended up being a, a way for a lot of people to connect in a way that probably would have happened over time, you know. But, yeah. You know, it was interesting that, you know, all these things it took, you know, this time of separation to meet people you know yeah. in fact uh, uh Corey lynn green is a great example oh uh, yeah we had her on the podcast she's delightful she is a fantastic musician and and you know lives gosh maybe i mean i can see the other side of the mountain that she like she lives on the other side of the mountain that i look at you know yeah. so we're, we're within a very short drive of one another but it took the pandemic for me to get to know her because we all got involved with this thing called socially distant fest. And okay. it, I, I would, you know, put my shows up on their channel and do some of their shows. And that's how I actually ended up networking with a lot of new fans. But Corey was one of these people that I was like, how did we never officially meet in the real world prior to this, but then became friends over the pandemic. And now of course we've, you know, gotten to perform together. I just performed with her last week. And, and oh, you know, that is so great. So it, I, 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 you know, I truly can't say enough about the whole experience. And that's why I want to bring it back. I, I don't know if I could ever, you know, I mean, the fact that I did pretty much one every week for a year, I tried to make that my goal. You know, it's like, let's just not have a break in the action for one year. And mm -hmm. so I did almost one year, and then I did a few scattered ones and I've done a few like, you know, things here and there, but I, I'm always looking for ways to kind of take that same form and adapt it. Now that we are back into live, you know, territory, how can we can, you know, do it? And I've got some ideas on, on what I would do. So. <laughs> so a little hybrid going yeah. on here. Well, those are really some standout moments and you know what else really stands out in the Valley? Oh, what's that? I'm going to tell you. Yeah. So it's, oh, wow. It's our sponsor, pre popsterish Gourmet oh, Popcorn. It's Shenandoah Valley's only award-winning popcorn. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Mm. Man. It is popcorn so good. Popcorn Awards. <laughs> That's right. They give those out, too. <laughs> like the and, pop, the popskers? No, I don't know. <laughs> but let me tell you what else. Their kernels are grown right here in the Shenandoah Valley, and their factory is 100% nut-free. There are absolutely no nuts anywhere in the factory or production process. Well, no corn nuts, but popcorn. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, I think I'm seeing. I think I'm seeing what's going on. <laughs> You're picking up when I'm laying down. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, Bill, it's great for any gifting occasion. Perfect for birthdays, anniversaries, literally anything that comes up. Well, you know, if something pops up and I need some, I <laughs> I know where to go, I guess. I mean, right here in our own community. That's exactly right. They are located in Bridgewater, Virginia. How far is that from you? Oh, be mere minutes. We're talking, we're talking maybe 10 minute drive. There <laughs> you go. North River Marketplace right there on Main Street. Well, I cannot wait uh, to try some award-winning Shenandoah Valley popcorn. That's amazing. Well, you are in luck because we're going to send you some free popcorn for being a guest on our show. I think my mind just popped. I'm not even <laughs> joking. <Yeah. laughs> I'm just blowing your mind. This is well, great. I, I, I'm a popcorn fan, so this is, uh, this, is, this is good news for me. Well, good. And I'm about to blow the mind of the laughers, too, because... Free Popsterist offers a Laffer's discount. Just use promo code LAFF15 to get a 15% discount when you visit prepopsterous.com. That's P-R-E-P-O-P-S-T-E-R-O-U-S.com. And there you will find a variety of their delicious flavors where you can purchase some today. Yum. Oh, man. Well, now you've got me hungry. So that's... Uh, that's... <laughs> The rest of the interview will have that kind of angst. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And we're around lunchtime, too. So <laughs> at this free time of this recording. So good luck to you, Bill. <laughs> That's OK. It's OK. I'll, uh, you know, I don't I'll, I'll be looking forward for, to that uh, preposterous coming my way. I'll have to I'll have to make do until then. <laughs> Luckily, I've got an, uh, a very animatedly large cup of coffee to uh, to to hold me over until then. <laughs> yeah. What size is that thing? It's huge. <laughs> that's 
Uh, that's a four cupper, I think, at least. Uh, you know, I would there. say at least. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I'm I'm about a one and a half of those, and then I'm 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 full uh, interview speed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, it's showing and you're doing amazing. So let's talk about you some more. Oh, my favorite re- topic. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You, um, well, actually, I read this article where you mentioned that you picked up fans from all over the world through those live streams. Can you share some specific stories or interactions with the fans that left a lasting impact on you? Absolutely. I, um, you know, as the, you know, you, you go along and especially once Brittany, you know, kind of became involved with the, I want to say like the admin <laughs> of the mm-hmm, live yeah. stream, you know, it, it was really easy to start seeing, you know, you start seeing the same names pop up and start seeing, you know, some of that community being built and, and getting involved with uh socially distant fest really helped that too, because that, that became a really, a big Facebook group that, a lot of creatives and musicians and, and and whatnot were just getting together and you would sign up for little time slots and they would do monthly, you know, uh, showcases and things like that. So you started seeing these names, you know, pop up over and over again. And, and I mean, I became friends, you know, in real life with them. And I've, I've, I've always been a little technophobic. I won't lie. Like I'm, I'm not, I've, I've always been the, the reluctant adapter to what happens more than the, you know, I'm going to be ahead of the curve. It's like, okay, I guess internet's real, you know, we're, <laughs> we're keeping that, you know, so you're going to have to too. learn. So it, it's always grudgingly been, with each one of these things. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, that, that, that was, you know, I've always been, I don't want to say skeptical, but like, like you, I don't know these people. They're like thousands of miles away. Like how, how, how do I know these people? This is not real. You know? <laughs> but <laughs> I, the pandemic really made it where I realized, you know, that, that, that connection can be real. And, and, and you do, you do make friends, you know, if you have these things. So we made, you know, buddies that I still haven't met. There's, there's the guys that uh, ran socially distant fest, uh, you know, they live down in Georgia and we didn't get down that way yet in the tours the last couple of years once things opened back up. So I keep telling them, I was like, man, as soon as we get back through Georgia, like I'm looking forward to meeting you. And a couple of people came through here. We like had folks come, you know, that were once things opened back up, we we had a little reunion here in town and met met a few people that were, you know, East Coasters on the on the socially distant fest. So I've I've gotten to know a few, you know, people in the real world and um fans that showed up at, you know, shows after that too. Uh, we've we just um, you know, folks that maybe I had seen at shows before too. Like that was an interesting one too. Uh, people that I was like, Oh yeah, I've seen you at a Judy chop show before. And they, they became more like, you know, like conversational friends <laughs> because of that. So, and, and then, you know, internationally there was a, there's like a, a lady that we met um, named Maddie over in, um, Oh gosh, like, the Netherlands somewhere. I can't remember exactly where in the Netherlands, but she beautiful, you know, folky singer songwriter. And, and she, um, older lady, you know, and she liked all these like same, we loved all these same artists, you know, like, you know, John Prine and all this like folky stuff. So I was like, Oh, you know, it's, and, and even though we're, you know, thousands of miles away, it's like, you know, like touched by these people. I have another like friend out in Arizona, Kathy Colmer. She's, uh, you know, helps, organize a festival out there that Corey played at, um, in mm-hmm. Tucson, Tucson folk festival. Um, got to know her, you know, because of the John Prine thing, she heard me playing a John Prine song and she's, a oh, huge fan and, neat. you know, just sent me a little painting that she made. She made this little, like one, like maybe like two inch rectangle painting of me that just w- like a little watercolor and sent it my way, you know, as a little thing. And, you know, when she ordered merch, you know, from me and it was like, you know, those little friendships that are still, you know, like we'll still check, you know, I'll, she'll still pop in on my Facebook or, you know, whatever and say, you know, oh, like when, in fact, when Corey and I played together last week, she said, oh, you know, I wish I could be there. You know, I, I one of these days we all got to get together. So if anything, it's it's created. Uh, I, I joke. I was like, oh, it's future tour routes. You know, I, I'm just going to go start checking those folks off the list that I haven't gotten a chance to meet yet. You know, and 
play in their towns because that's that's how this world works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're in the different world. Certainly the pandemic the pandemic has had a significant impact on the music industry, speaking of which. And how do you see the future of live streams in the post-COVID era? And how has it changed your approach to music and performance? I think it's, you know, man, when things open back up and and performance opportunities kind of started again, you know, it was immediately a different metric system. Mm. Um, the, the numbers weren't quite the same. I don't know that uh, we've necessarily seen. I mean, it, people didn't completely disappear, but, but also I think people, it, we've always been in music world. I always joke, you know, when, when people say, do you think that other artists or other shows are your, your thing you're up against. I say, no way. I want there to be a million venues and a million bands and a million different arts opportunities. What we're actually fighting against is streamers and television and, Mm. you know, DJs music at a, at a dance club that doesn't need to be, I'm not, there's an art in that. I don't want to, I don't want to rile up my my DJ crowd, (laughs) but you know what I mean? It's like you have a million different like avenues for these things. And I think, Partially in the pandemic, that kind of became apparent to an extent. You know, we we got selective with what we because we had fewer opportunities. People got more selective with with how they with how they look at their you know spending their their mm-hmm. time, their, even their time expenditure. And you know, I think to to I, I, one thing that I was acutely aware of was that it was going to be important um moving forward to be offering more experience based mm. um mm-hmm. opportunities you know not just mm-hmm. you know even even in your standard we're going to have a show at a venue or a bar how do you make that show different from the last show you did from the next show at the bar two bars down mm-hmm. how, how are those experiences because that's what people want that and, we're having that's happening in comedy also I think, I, yeah, mm-hmm. I bet I can. I, and, and, and it's, you know, i I think there's also, also another thing that became really apparent to me is that, you know, people do value production to an extent mm-hmm. and, you know, to be the person in charge of the production um, is important because if you can make your own opportunities, like the live stream was that for me, I, I it became an opportunity that I didn't, see as an opportunity until it was happening. And I was like, oh, yes. I'm, I'm, this is a thing, you know? And I realized like, if you can create that and you mm-hmm. can be the person that does that, then you open those opportunities, not only up for yourself, which, you know, as a independent, you know, artist and, you know, business person in the arts, you know, that's important for me, but it also opens it up for other people. And then I've started realizing what I can do to help other people and, have more shows happen and have more opportunities for that happening. And, you know, how a live stream fits in there, I think partially I've I've noticed a lot of artists, you know, once we got back the number of live streams, you know, you know, like dipped. And I mean, I'm, I'm just as guilty of it. I I kind of stopped doing it, (laughs) but yeah, I have noticed a lot of people engaging their social media in that way more. Yes. So, yes. you know, you're at a show, they they put their phone up and it's the bass player from this band. And he's got his, he's just, you're watching him, you know, and you look, he's like, oh, he's got people streaming himself just playing bass at this place because people do want to have that connection still in, in whatever way they can. Yeah. Would they be able to sit down and watch a whole show? Well, some people still do. And in fact, I mean, one of the things that I, I never really thought about were, those things, right? Like people that maybe are mobility issues or Mm -hmm. have, um, anxiety and, and, and those things that don't, I mean, I, I'll be honest, you know, I love being on stage in front of 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. I'm not so fond of being sometimes in a crowd of 10,000 people. So, yeah, you know, I think there's a, there's a certain amount of that that still happens where people find, try to find those avenues where they can be a part of a show or a part of a, you know, a concert and, you know, not, not have that uncomfortable side of it. And 
if anything, I think, you know, we all, everybody beefed up their, you know, like, you know, their media, you know, I think a yeah. lot and, and pandemic. So I think there's still places where that's going to be important to learn, important to integrate. And I think that's the big thing I'm starting to try to think about is, well, how do you integrate those things? You know, mm-hmm. I'm, we're out there on the road, uh, you know, doing shows and whatnot. Um, how do I maybe talk to somebody, you know, I meet some pretty interesting people. And one of the things that happened in the confessional was I would tell band stories, things that happened. Oh, oh, people would love that. And so I think there's, you know, I I think there's still an avenue for that. You know, there's still, you know, people would like to hear that. And I would like to hear it from other people that we meet on the road. I mean, that's, you know, what a lot of the times when you're backstage at a festival or a, a venue, what the musicians talk about, like, a, oh, we just played that. And how was it? Oh, well, this was cool. But let me tell you this crazy thing that happened. And then, you know, I've told my own stories many times, but I've also told my friends backstage stories before because it's like, man, had you ever heard this one? And like, you know, it's like, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's fun. So I think there's a lot of places where that live stream and even podcasting. I mean, I've, I've, I've never dipped my toe into it, but I've thought about it before. It's like, wow, maybe, maybe taking that concept and, you know, being able to do that on the road might be a little easier than, you know, me, you know, yeah. this, this whole setup. Uh, one thing I've always wanted to do uh, is take the confessional and take two, you know, new clean, let me, let me be, very clear two new clean porta potties that have never been used and turn those into a festival installation where I could do a confessional. So you come in on one side and I'm on the other side. We lift a little, we lift a little screen just like you do at the confessional. And then you tell me something that happened over the course of the festival. We would do it on the last day of the festival and it could be me giving the confessional as you leave. If you wanted to do it. Oh, that we, sounds fabulous. So I've got I've got some ideas on how uh, how I could take things I learned how to do and and what people found in those moments in the live stream and try to like also work them into a you know a live performance setting. So we'll see if I can ever uh, one of these days uh, when I have the time. I'm sure I'll <laughs> I'm sure I'll get it all set. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's taking the Reverend Bill's confessional on the road right there. I would say yeah, one of these yeah. days. <laughs> What are what's another idea or two that you can elaborate on for your plans for future live shows and collaborations with other bands? Speaking of that, well, one thing we 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 actualized um, started talking about as the Judy Chops in the pandemic, and then have actually actualized in the in the post pandemic world was Stanton Jams. Um, oh yeah, there was this um, you know day kind of block party festival thing in Stanton called Stanton Jams for years. And even before the pandemic, um, it had kind of stalled out, I guess, is the best way to, to say it. But the lady that um, organized it, Sarah Lynch, um, she also does Queen City Mischief and Magic, which is a mm-hmm. you know Harry Potter themed uh, production up in Stanton. And I think it just got to be that got very big for her very quickly. And so she had to kind of focus on that and then you know, pandemic came and it shut everything down. And it, we started kind of talking amongst ourselves about like, well, wouldn't it be interesting if we maybe took that back over? And the, the Findels in Stanton were the band that it was kind of built around and it was kind of their thing. And they had already expressed that they didn't want to keep it going prior to the pandemic coming around too. So we, we saw that void and, and, you know, we're able to, you know, kind of work with Sarah for us to take it over. And we've been now, producing it for this is the second year, I guess um, we're, we're getting ready in two weeks actually to have our, our fall fundraiser, which is <laughs> rager. Little, yeah. You know, it. <laughs> we, we, we partying in the streets of Stanton. <laughs> so we, we always have a, uh, and that, so that was just something that we kind of, you know, cooked up and, and then actually got to, you know, yeah see, you know, coming and now it's turned into its own, its own thing. And we're, we're working with it fun team of people to, to pull that off every year. And, um, I want to definitely get into more production work because it's, it's something that I, you know, I really, I've always loved, I mean, it's, it's again, going back to theater, you know, I, it, you, you get in this like, you know, troop of people and, and, you know, 
for me, especially my young days in theater, my family didn't have a lot of money. So for us at those summer theater, summer stock things, you have to usually pay a little bit, you know, everybody mm-hmm. kind of pays in. Well, if you couldn't pay, you got to build the sets, you know, and does that ever make you feel like you're more part of a production because you've put your blood, sweat and tears into yes. actually building those walls and doing that, you know, thing and making this world happen from start to finish. And uh, it's kind of the same in music for me. I, I want to, you know, not only, you know, I've, I've learned a lot in the past 20 odd years. I've been, you know, touring and playing and booking and managing bands and things like that, my own bands. So now I'm, I'm starting to look at, you know, well, maybe, maybe I can do this for other people. Maybe I can, you know, offer more productions so that all the talented people I know have more places to play. And so I'm, I'm, I'm dipping my hands and feet and jumping in full, (laughs) you know, (laughs) in in certain areas, trying to figure that out and, you know, learning as I go this summer, I got to also be a part of the Levitt, um, downtown series. I was uh, uh, on the core committee for that and got to go to LA last year uh, for Harrisonburg and, you know, get some training from Levitt and things like that. And had a, had a, just, I, I said it the other night and, 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 and realized I truly meant it. Like I, I kind of fell in love with my community here in Harrisonburg uh, even more, uh, you know, yeah. because of it. Cause it's easy sometimes when you're, you're, music world keeps you moving to not feel, even though I, you know, we're not on the road, you know, 365 or anything, but you know, you're, you're gone. And so you don't always feel fully connected to even the place that you live, Mm -hmm. but doing that and going every week and then also helping with, you know, the various, you know, functions of that just made me, made me love, you know, our, our community here and, and realize that there's, you know, there's a lot that we, that we have uh, going for us. And I think a lot of room to grow and I want to keep being a part of that, uh, that world and growing that culture in our area, because I think, you know, Shenandoah Valley is filled with artists. And I think people mm-hmm. would be surprised to know actually how many, how many yeah. you know, people are creative in this, in this community yeah. and it doesn't get the spotlight that I'd like to see even statewide. We've, we've been really, yes involved in the more broad Virginia music scene for a long time. And and that's another one of my many goals is to shine a spotlight on the Shenandoah Valley in particular, because I think, you know, it's been such a good place for us. It's why I've never moved out. People ask why we don't move. Oh, you guys are so good. Why didn't you, why don't you move to Nashville? And I'm like, well, for one, it's stupidly expensive to live there. <laughs> and uh, it's a lot cheaper. I won't tell you my rent, but I'll tell you this. It's three times less than what I would pay for anything approaching a, a house in Nashville for what I'm doing here. And I can drive to Nashville from here. So it's not that big of a deal. You know? Yeah. So it's, I, I think, you know, um, I, I really want to, to show, you know, on a statewide level and a national level, I think that, you know, this, area is beautiful, not just for the surroundings. It's a very artistically and art and arts forward place. Uh, uh, I couldn't, ag- I couldn't agree more. I'm curious where this nickname came from as we've been talking, Reverend Bill Howard. Tell me about that. Well, it's, it's certainly, um, it's been with me a long time. Um, probably a little bit in high school, um, was the first time that anybody called me Reverend Bill. Um, I was kind of a weird kid. I didn't grow up, <laughs> as you can maybe tell. From Surprise, the Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was not a particularly spiritual person growing up. Um, we didn't, I mean, I always say that we were Christian by name, you know, and we would, we would, we would go to church maybe once a year, you know, ish, you know, ish, you know, go to a go strong to, ish. It sounds like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Functions at church from time to time. Yeah. And, and, and it wasn't, you know, I don't know. It was not something that was like forefront, but then at some point in my teens, I got very interested in, in religion and philosophy and, and all sorts of, you know, the, the life of the mind, I guess you'd say. And so I, I started going to church and again, followed a, a young lady uh, and her family into a church. I sense and, a theme here. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm a romantic. <laughs> what can I say? You know? <sighs> and so I, yeah, they were like, Oh, you want to come to church with us this Sunday? And I would, you know, go. And the very first one that I went to was a real, 
with fire and brimstone type mm-hmm. of church. And, and, and I felt really, um, singled out, you know, like as a, like, I would feel like every time this guy says sinners or non-believers, he's looking right at me and I'm like, ah, you're just paranoid. Cause you're like a young punk, you know, like <laughs> here with your girlfriend, you know, like kind of, mm. thing. and truly, uh, the first chance he got to corner me, he was looking right at me and making sure that he was trying to save me from that moment on. And so wow, when that, um, relationship ended yeah because high school relationships end (laughs) usually usually Uh, yeah the uh, it became very apparent why i had been there and why i was putting so much time and effort into this belief right and and so i got kind of away from it for a while until i followed the next lady into a church uh again and and Uh it was a more forward thinking situation and and kind of kind of seeing like two sides of that coin there was a moment where I thought, well, maybe this is a, a, a place for me. Maybe I could be a minister or a reverend of some sort. Um, I didn't grow up Catholic or anything. So I, I knew that wasn't going to be the extreme. I wasn't going to, you know, uh, do the, the vow of celibacy or anything, but uh, being the romantic, of course. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, that makes total so, sense, Bill. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I definitely, you know, I thought maybe that would be a, a, a path. And, and, and it actually uh, did look into it even as I went into college and kind of flirted around with the idea of going into the, the seminary. And, and I worked at a, a, you know, a Christian summer camp, you know, and, and did some things like some ministry, you know, adjacent type work. And I just, over time, it became really apparent that I loved the theater of it. Um, again, you know, as a theater kid, I loved the, the promise of it, but I wasn't so sure that the practice was something that I was real comfortable with because there's a lot of the times I think in any kind of institutionalized, uh, anything where you're going to, to see, uh, how flawed humanity <laughs> really can be. And, and it, as, as I went along, I just knew that the, the world of that as a job was not something that I could do because one, my belief system actually didn't line up with that. Um, my Mm -hmm. belief system was different and I, I became very comfortable with that personally, but realized that that was not something that would have translated into me. Like I wasn't ready to make a church out of that. (laughs) So, uh, I got away from that idea. Uh, and, but the nickname stuck. So it, it yeah. kind of started in high school. A, a guy called me that. And then I was in a band for a, a few years. That first band out of college uh, was with my cousin, Jeremiah Prophet. And I know Jeremiah. Yeah. So <laughs> he's so been on Jer- the podcast too. <laughs> exactly. So Jeremiah Prophet, he's my first cousin. We grew up, you know, my first band experiences were with him. We, we all, you know, cut our teeth around the same time. And he was gigging. Uh, the before like when I went to school he's four years older than me so when I went to college like he was already gigging in town here and having like pretty regular shows so that was like the first you know I would go and play with him we were Jeremiah Prophet and the Reverend Bill so that's really <laughs> I love that where the name got <laughs> to stick and it just yeah. stuck and I've I've stuck with it and it has been somewhat of an informing it does inform a little bit of some of what how I look at things and think it does kind of you know, it's been a it's been a name that served me well over the years, I think. <laughs> yes, because as a musician, it definitely sounds like spirituality plays a role in your creative process and your music. How does it influence your songwriting and performance specifically? Well, for me, you know, I, I think one of the things where I really like took a took a hard turn from Christianity, I guess, was I don't think that we're meant to know. I don't think that we're necessarily built to know what comes after, after, because otherwise there wouldn't be an after, (laughs) you know? Mm. So, you know, a lot of time spent worrying about what happens at the end and what happens after to me feels like lost time. (laughs) You know what I mean? So to me, what's more important is being in awe of the mystery of that whole process. Uh, and that's really, to me, a really divine 
guide, right? So to me, the the God, if there's a God, is the mystery. It's 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 that what that that big question mark as to why are we here? Why does my mind work like this? Why do I have all these things to say? Why do I have all these feelings? And I think to me, that's a much more worthwhile pursuit than really being too worried about all of the other trappings of what religion can be in your life. So once I kind of opened myself up to that idea, that creative process is very much the same thing that, that, you know, people call it like, you know, Oh, am I channeling, you know, the divine? I don't know if that's real, but do I, have I seen it happen in real world in improv shows in music shows where there's is something that isn't it's yes, I've practiced this instrument or I've done my improv and I'm really comfortable on stage. You can do that and get all the, all the mechanical part of it in. And there's still something uh, mysterious and beautiful that happens that is divine and it's outside of yourself Mm -hmm. um, that happens. And I think uh, that to me is also proof of whatever you want to call the divine. So I, when I, when I, write or I play or I, I do that stuff. I try to remember to kind of keep myself open to that higher consciousness. And as those, those moments of like, you know, magic that you can open yourself up to on stage, you know, and, and, or if I'm sitting around, you know, playing or writing, you know, I mean, just the other day I hadn't written a song in six, eight months, something like that. I did a, um, uh, songwriter night, uh, at Clementine and, uh, Corey Lynn actually was there and a couple of oh, local, yeah. local yeah. songwriters. And we, um, the next morning, you know, I woke up and it was as if, as if from the divine, I had sat down with my, <laughs> my abnormally large cup of coffee. And, uh, <laughs> I, I had a melody, uh, kind of in my head. I sang out the first line that the melody kind of th- made me think about. And it was off to the races. I wrote a song that was done in an hour or so. And it's like, you know, isn't that a spark of the divine? I'm not saying that, you know, it came from a higher place per se, but opening yourself up to just letting that, that moment unfold is, is, is pretty spiritual to me. And so, and same with like, I mean, I I got really heady into, um, like, uh, the beats like Jack Kerouac and all those guys. And, I, you know, did a lot of poetry and, and performance poetry, even in slams and things like that at one point in my life. So a lot of that poetry was built that way. It's a, you know, you, you start writing and you just stream of consciousness, consciousness until it's done. And I just love that. <laughs> I just love all aspects of that as a, as a writer, as a performer. And to me, that is how we connect with the divine, at least at least as much of a religion as I have uh, to to give anybody. So, (laughs) Uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that. You guys are doing some really beautiful work with the band there, the Judy Chops. I went to your website. You have five albums available there. I think you have more, though, in the hopper. And I would love it if you could share with the laughers a sneak peek and what they can expect in the upcoming months from the Judy Chops. Absolutely. Yeah. We've been hard at work since the pandemic, uh, November of 2020 ish. Uh, we started, um, recording. Um, we did a little four song kind of EP to start and, and released, um, songs over the next year and a half or so on Spotify. And, um, that turned into another four songs at the same studio. And, um, eventually we're going to put that out on an album. We've been, we've been saying, Hey, it's going to be coming this year. And then for some reason, something, you know, holds it up and <laughs> things you know, happen. It yeah. happens. So yeah. I've, I've just started saying it's coming soon uh, because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's been paid for. It's done. Um, it's going to happen. Um, that album is going to be called the good days. Um, and they, uh, we've been, We've been, you know, slowly working on, you know, videos and and things like that uh, for for that album and want to put it out as a vinyl at some point. So we're we're kind of in that process and I'm hoping sometime in the in the early part of next year to have that in people's hands. And um, I'm also in the in the process of kind of getting a solo album, you know, sorted out and I'll be 
uh, no, no exact date on starting that uh, yet, but I've started the conversations with my, with my engineer friends and uh, started getting that uh, out in the universe so that I can get that started. Cause by the end of next year, I hope to have that done as well. Yeah. Got some great stuff in the pike with the albums. And then you also make music videos yeah. out of the songs. One I watched that's available on the Judy It's it's called Let It Burn. And it you have a YouTube channel too, I see. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. What goes into creating these music videos and how do you come up with the ideas for the visuals? The Let It Burn. Laughers, just go experience it. That's all I can say. I was sitting there going, what creativity? What is happening here? So talk to <laughs> me about this. <laughs> so, well, you know, I, being being like a theater kid and, and, and being that having that, you know, in your background, like visual is, is important to me and how, how things look. And we've always had a, a vibe, you know, so we've always we've always had, you know, graphic designers. I, I do a little graphic design, too, when I. I'm, although it's all self-taught and I've had to do it, learn it in, in terms of how to do it for the band. But even one of our bandmates, our drummer, Jess is a, is a graphic designer. So she, she, you know, has done some work for us. So we've always kind of wanted things to have a certain look. And so when you approach video stuff, you know, you kind of sit around and think like, well, you know, like what's the, is if there's a story behind it, you know, mm. is there a story uh, is, you know, can you, can you build a narrative and, and, we hadn't really done a lot of that type of work. So with let it burn, I really wanted, you know, I wanted it to have more of a cinematic, you know, quality or a story arc because I want that to be something that we do more of and, and think about. So luckily, you know, I, I, that we have some great local video guys. Um, this one was done by our friends at blue summit pictures. Um, a guy named Tarek and, uh, he, you know, I, I had met him, the, at, right around the time of our last album release, which was in 2018, 2019, um, we had a song that he heard that he actually approached us and I asked if he could do a video for it. And at that point, we were super busy and it it kind of got tabled. It was one of those things that like, I do want to do this. Yes, let's do it. Let's figure out when that happens. And, you know, flash forward, the pandemic happens. And then it's like, <laughs> five years until you even like, like reconnect, you know, but I, when I finally did, you know, reconnect with him and, and I, I sent him kind of my, my idea for the video, um, which was, I, you know, that song is all about climate change. And uh, there was a day in Harrisonburg. Um, this would have been uh, probably about 2018. Mm -hmm. There was a fire up on the skyline drive. Oh yeah. Yeah. That day I was working at Bella Gelato downtown and you could just, you, people would come in and they'd have like cinder and soot on their, on their you know, glasses. And, and, and I would, I'd walk out and like, you just see little like bits of soot, you know, raining down on the, on the valley here. And so the first line of that song is, uh, you know, like I can't breathe because they're burning the trees. There's smoke in the valley and soot in the breeze. Mm -hmm. And, and that line just rattled around for a while. He just, you know, didn't really have much of a song for it, but just that idea. And then eventually this, as the song, as I started like fleshing out the song and thinking about what it was, it was a very visual song in my mind. I had very, you know, mon money burning and, 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 you know, there's a line about the wave coming, you know, and, and washing us all away. And like that idea of like, you know, apocalyptic feel. And also this like, flippant way that we're kind of treating our planet. You know, we're like, mm -hmm. we've been talking about this for longer than I've been alive. Almost the entire time that my mother was alive, we've been talking about climate change and everybody's like, yeah, we'll get to it. Right. We got like, we got a couple of years before that's a really a problem. Well, like, you know, now that, you know, we're seeing some of these ramifications in a more, you know, real world everyday place. And we're still like, yeah, you know, we'll just go to Mars. We'll, we'll Mars it out, right? We're just <laughs> <laughs> just Mars it out. <laughs> I'm like, it's, it's no problem. Answer. We'll just travel eighteen months one way. Yeah. See we'll how it is. goes. We'll figure it out. Well, we can probably take it <laughs> like a hundred, hundred or two hundred people up at a time. Yeah. What you know? So, that, so the the sarcasm of that idea of like, fine, let it burn. 
let it burn away. You know, like it's fine. We're just going to burn it. So that was kind of like the, the backbone. And then I, I kind of went there and had, had a, you know, real idea of like a naysayer type of character that is like trying to get people to understand that this is what is happening. And then nobody's listening and what, it, you know, you know, the guys over at blue summit helped me kind of, you know, feel it out. And how can we do it, you know, on the, on the cheap with like the two or three of us that you had the time to you know <laughs> act in it and do things. So it, we, it turned into, you know, Alan, our sound guy, you know, in a, in a, uh, gas mask, you know, I the, thought that the, was him. I was going to uh, ask. Okay. And, and, and it was a great, a great time. And the story of it's, you know, exactly what I wanted. It's, it's this, it's after we're gone and, and what happens, you know, is it, it kind of leaves you wondering, like, is this guy re- really seeing these things or is it just him remembering the, the feeling of what life was like before? And, and, and that's, uh, you know, not to be grim or anything about the climate change part of it, but it is something that I think a lot about, you know, I don't have children, but you know, my, my bandmates do. And I often wonder, it's like, well, what does that world look like for these kids that are eight years old? You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> what does that, what does that world look like when she's 42? Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, cause like I, this world certainly looks way different than it did when I was 20 than it did when I was 10 and eight and five. And, you know, I can only imagine, you know, like if, if you, if you let the mind mind go. So that's kind of the background for that video. And then that's, that's how we approach them. It's like, you know, what are, what are those image? Cause I, when you write, I, it is often, you know, for me, at least I'd often have images associated with the things that I'm writing. So it's, it's, there's a, there's a firm image up there and uh, it's kind of fun to try to see that image taken from page to to screen uh, and, and a new thing for us when we, when we've been doing it. Cause a lot of the times you can do videos, it's like, we know how to play our guitar and then we can just stand there and play our <laughs> guitar and then put the song. Up there. So a lot of the videos that you do early on tend to be that. And then now it's like, Oh, let's, let's try to think of some, some fun things to do and, and other, other creative avenues. So yeah, and a way to support other artists, which is another thing we've always loved to do. So, yeah. It reminds me, I was saying this when we interviewed the Hackens boys, because they have some really cool music videos also. Absolutely. And it reminds me of the early MTV days, you know. And Absolutely. It's really a nice throwback to see coming back. It really is. I think, you know, the the ability for people to have this equipment at a lower cost point and then educate yourselves on how to like do it has really made for, I mean, to me, it's like always like the DIY idea, you know, like in music, especially it's like as much as I can cut out the middleman and and be able to do it myself and learn how to do it myself. It's yeah. good. And also, and then as you collaborate with other people, the more that you understand about how to do it, it's, it's so much nicer to be able to like get these things rolling. So that's always been my thing. I like to learn I like to learn a little bit. I'm I'm a, a jack of all trades, master of <laughs> master none. Of none. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a great segue to the next question. Then, can you share any advice or insights for aspiring musicians and artists who are navigating the challenges and opportunities presented by the current music landscape? Well, you know, we talked a little bit about like separating yourself um, from from other folks. And it's not about like, you know, being like, oh, I'm so much better than X, Y or Z. It's about how amidst the landscape of, of, of these choices and people and things, how you work into that, you know, and, and how you how you get people to to pay attention. And that is a hard thing for, for mm-hmm. us, you know, early on with the Judy Chops um, having a strong female presence in the band was, was kind of a, and still to an extent is a shock to some people. They're like, Oh, girls can, you know, play Mm -hmm. guitars and stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Girls can do stuff. (laughs) Exactly. They they, they can do all sorts of things. So surprise. (laughs) early on, that was always funny to me because it was people were like, wow, you know, how did you do that? And I was like, well, I mean, just friends with these people and they happen to be amazing musicians and they happen to be females, but it's not lost on me that that was a marketing, Mm -hmm. you know, possibility. And, and so early on, it, it made sense to, to 
to play up femme energy and what we do. And we still do, obviously, because it's that is what we're doing here. We're 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 all people playing our music, doing our thing. So yeah. that was one way that we used to kind of like, you know, early on, you know, separate a l- little bit from other bands in their same genre. And then learning how to make those things not just be a shtick, right? Like it's mm-hmm. it's for us, you know, I'm lucky that I have three really great songwriters in my band. And so, you know, I get to write my own songs, but then I also get to like have this team of people that I can work with and go like, well, Hey, this is my idea. What do you think? You know? So looking around your, your resources around you, you know, whether you're a solo artist, um, trying to put a band together, um, whether you're, you've got a band, you know, and you don't know how to book shows and do all this stuff. Well, look around at your, at your assets in your, in your group and your, in your community and go, okay, you know, this friend is an amazing photographer. So Mm -hmm. I need uh, band photos to show people what our band looks like when I go and ask this venue for a show. So I'm going to go to that friend. I'm going to work out something with him and get some photos. And I'm going to go to that friend that does video and I'm going to work out a little video. I'm going to ask my friend over here that does, you know, audio to record an album for us. And the next thing you know, you've been doing this for years and years. You've developed networks. You've Mm -hmm. met, you know, booking agents because your friend that owns the studio or runs the studio over here, he's like, you know what? You should play this festival that my friend runs. Mm -hmm. And you, you just continue to like, I always say it's, it's all about, you know, not, it's moving forward is what it's all about. And again, mm-hmm. same thing, Prof, never saying no. Yeah. I mean, protect, yes. Protect your, and <laughs> protect your interests. Yeah. Certainly. Because there yes. are many, many bad apples in the entertainment world, sadly, that will take advantage of you. Protect your interests and keep your head on a swivel, but always keep moving forward and seeing where those pathways take you. Because I mean, our most, meaningful and impactful shows and festivals and things like that that we've done have all been because someone before that said, you know, who's a decent band or easy to work with or nice people or whatever Mm -hmm. the Judy shops and Mm -hmm. or Reverend Bill or whatever it is. And that has just been able for me to, to build reputations and build those things up. And that's what it's all about in the arts world, because I agree. I've met a lot of people that are super talented way more talented than me. In fact, yeah. I've met some very, some very, you know, impressive folks that don't get how to be that good person to be around. Mm-hmm. And difficult to work with. Sometimes mm-hmm. it works. If you're, if your talent is undeniable, you'll get there. But mm-hmm. if you're like, I'd say the 90% of the rest of us where we're all just trying to get better and keep working. Cause it's always been, you know, people ask like, what, why do you do this? Would I love to be famous? 100%. Who wouldn't like, don't lie to yourself and be like, no, I don't need the fame. No, everybody would love to be some level of that. I, 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 you know, but what I've always tried to do is work. I've never mm-hmm. tried to do anything else but work. And that's how you do it. It's just being a good person and, and, making yourself part of communities and continuing mm-hmm. to build community around you. And if you do that, then it'll, it'll, it'll lead to something. It, will it be exactly what you had in your mind before? Maybe, maybe not, but it's going to be fulfilling because you'll have worked hard to get there and you've, you'll have worked and done the, the things that you need to do to learn how to get from point A to point B to point C. And that's, uh, that's the only thing that I can even look at and say is a key marker for success that, and, and just having a thick skin. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. (laughs) You know, I mean, like (sighs) if you believe in what you do and you you think what you're doing is worth it, have a thick skin because you're going to ask, you're going to have a lot of rejection. And even at this point in the game, when we do pretty well for ourselves, we still deal with that. I mean, there's still, hundreds of festivals that I'd love to play that every year I get the same. I'll uh, thank sorry, you for but your it, submission. Yeah. Blah, blah, and, blah. Yeah. Know, and yeah. It used to really bug me. It used to really bug me. It still does. You know, it's still, there's still, you're human. There. Yeah. But 
look, you know, you just keep going. And then the next thing you know, you'll, you'll be, you'll be doing it. And if you're not doing it to the level that you want, you just keep doing it. And you're hoping, you that's know? right. And just that's take that. the next, yeah. Just take the next step. You cannot steer a non-moving truck. Amen. I, <laughs> yeah. I, got, I, I got to do a show with um, Dar Williams last year. Oh, wow. yeah. She, she came to Harrisonburg and they did a, a singer songwriter night and I got to interview her and it was very cool because like, you know, it, it probably shouldn't be any surprise that I, I like lady bands <laughs> being that I'm kind of. You know, <laughs> yeah. We you discovered know. that theme earlier, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I knew Dar Williams was yeah. because of um, the, the like uh, Lilith fair days and all that, you know, and, 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 and that era of like these strong lady, you know, folky singer chicks and like, oh, man. So I'm pretty nervous. And I look up uh, her book that was out at the time. I knew this tour was going to be also promoting a new book. So I was like, well, maybe I should read her book. And here's another one of those moments where you go like, call it divine or call it just like interesting timing. I'm over here thinking about doing Stanton jams. We had just started that whole thing. Um, I'm doing all this other, you know, community based kind of like arts work. Well, her book is called is all about that. Um, it's, it's about, she talks about the power of positive community. And mm. she says, you know, like her example of the, the start of the book is all about, you know, there's a hill and, you know, somebody's looking at it and he's like, oh, that would be a great hill for kids to sled down. We just got to find somebody to clear the hill. So mm -hmm. he goes and finds his friend that has the bush hog and the and the stuff to clear the hill and they do it. And then the next winter, people are there and they're able to use it. And then somebody comes up and says, can I sell hot chocolate here? And he says, why not? But let's do it the right way. And let's find this people. And the next thing you know, you've got this community hub and there's like a park that builds there and there's all this stuff. And it's like, I told her when I met her, I was like, it's like your book just plopped into my lap at the like exact time when all I, that's all I was thinking about is how do I make these opportunities happen? So that, that idea of just, just being open to what's around in your community and, 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 and relying on those people. Cause they're here. We're all here. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. all ready to do these things and see these beautiful moments of community happen and this beautiful impact that, and, and then to see that moment start mm -hmm. and start for someone else and start for the next person. And that beautiful butterfly effect happens instead of all the sad stuff that could happen. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. And a great note to end on. And so now what I want to ask before we wrap up here, a very important question, how best can people, well, especially our lappers, follow you on social media and Ju the Judy Chops and otherwise to connect with you all and get more information. Absolutely. The Judy Chops, go to the JudyChops.com. And I believe there are links up there to all the social media, um, YouTube channels, Instagram, Facebook. Um, there's also Bandcamp where we have some of our albums up uh, digitally for sale. Um, there's also uh, there on the website ways to contact us. And um, that will be also the place where I'll, we'll be putting up information about that new album and when that's coming and, and any any new information will either be up on the website or uh, on Facebook and Instagram. And then as far as Reverend Bill solo stuff, um, I, I have a, an Instagram that's uh, uh, at R-V-R-N-D Bill, Reverend Bill without the vowels and the and the Reverend there. And um, I also have a Facebook page, uh, Reverend Bill Howard. And I'm... I've got a lot of shows starting to pop up and things like that. And I've got a bunch of side projects and all sorts of other bands. I've got a band called Mothman Rodeo. We're going to be <laughs> doing some uh, shows around Halloween because it's kind of a spooky act. And uh, we'll be, uh, <laughs> that's fun. Yeah, it's it's you know, I, I just try to always be moving forward. I've got the Judy Chops have a little side project called the Newtown Queens. Um, it's me in the rhythm section from the Judy Chops. And so we'll be working some new shows this this fall and uh, doing a honky tonk night, I think, uh, later later on down the line at, uh, at the Golden Pony with Rebecca Porter. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, just Wonderful. To, yeah. Just trying to keep busy. You know, I, uh, idle hands uh, are, are not good for me. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell that you don't let the dust settle under your feet. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's funny. I, I, I only, I only do this type of work nowadays. And so it's, it's just, I have to feel like, you know, uh, I have to feel like I'm always moving forward doing stuff. 
um, or my partner will be incredibly uh, angry at me for not. <laughs> this is like, what are you just sitting around the house for? So that's <laughs> fine. I, I, I'll, I'll book a show, babe. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. I love her already. I need to meet her. <laughs> no, Brit- Brittany's the best. She's been keeping me alive for almost nine years now. <laughs> I think it's safe to say she's sticking around. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> well, Lappers, we'll be sure to put all that information for you in the show notes. Plus, we'll also have for you that discount promo code LAP15 so you can buy delicious gourmet popcorn at prepopsterous.com. And thank you so much for coming on the show today, Reverend Bill Howard. This has been super fun chatting up all things about your performance journey and the Judy Chops today. And I am so excited to see what's next for you and the band. Lappers, to listen and buy some of their music and find out more about where they're performing next, be sure to check them out at thejudychops.com. Also, check out their music videos and subscribe to their YouTube channel. Subscribe to the Judy Chops. And then don't forget to snag that discount on Prepopsterous using promo code LAP15 at prepopsterous.com today. That way, you can munch on it when you join me on next week's episode. And lastly, and most importantly, thanks for tuning in, Lappers. Out of all the podcasts out there, you picked us, and we think that's pretty darn special, just like you. Until next time, keep smiling. Bye! Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. We'll be dropping a new podcast every Wednesday. So check back for another uplifting episode. Come to an X2 Comedy show or let us bring one to you. To find out more, head to X2Comedy.com. Be sure to share this podcast with a friend. And until next time, cheers.